I changed the order actually. I uh, first will talk about ideas and then uh, results, and uh, you will probably find that I agree with uh, the with Niklas in on many points. Um, first, I will briefly uh, introduce NISO. NISO is an uh, is an independent research institute, so we we do projects for the food industry uh, and make profit in that way. So we usually don't fund uh, re uh, research; we carry out research and are paid for it. Um, we are originally uh, the Dutch Institute for Dairy Research, uh, but uh, gradually uh, we moved into all food science, and um, there are about 100 professionals, people actually, and um, we have um, all facilities for doing food science uh, on all levels, so from fun very fundamental to really applied, and, uh, th and that is a good position to, uh, to consider nutrient scattering from food science. Uh, so uh, my table of contents is short. I will uh, discuss, um, like, like Niklas did, uh, the, the unique applicability of especially neutrons. Uh, this, this talk is about neutrons, actually, and not so much about X-rays. And, uh, and then I will also uh, show some examples of uh, work in the past we did at NISO uh, using neutrons. So uh, now, as was already said many times, uh, the unique applicability of neutrons in food science uh, has a few uh, pillars. Uh, one of them is the HD substitution, uh, so you make hydrogen bonding uh, visible. And uh, um, another thing is that you can look into turbid systems, and uh, food is usually turbid. And uh, in that case, it helps when you use D2O and instead of H2O as a solvent, and then just uh, accept the fact that you may change the solvent quality a little bit. And uh, of course, a really important and, and uh, not optimally used advantage of neutrons is, uh, of course, that you can look through steel. And uh, food processing equipment is made of steel, and uh, so therefore it is uh, largely unknown for many very standard applications what happens inside all that steel. So for instance, uh, the effect of high pressure um, and the buildup of food food structure under shear. Now, the, I put those uh, in straight uh, font because they are available already. Um, less available, I'm not sure if they're completely unavailable, but not uh, widely explored yet, is uh, using neutron scattering for um, looking at fouling in heating equipment. Uh, look what, uh, what happens inside an homogenizer. And, and these are really quite pressing uh, questions because um, uh, redesigning homogenizers um, for for better uh, and better controllable uh, state of uh, emulsions is 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 uh, is really um, it is is bottlenecked by the fact that you can't see what happens inside. And um, and as Nico, Niklas already said, also uh, it is really interesting to look inside nozzles. Or, well, Niklas said uh, extruders, but that's also kind of nozzle. I mean more the nozzle uh, of a spray dryer. Um, and uh, as a kind of uh, beginner's case of uh, spray drying, you could see uh, electro spinning. It's easier to uh, bring within the reach of a neutron beam. Um, now here uh, I show uh, a picture which uh, comes from uh, Delft, from uh, Wim Baumann, um, where they built a shear cell uh, for neutron scattering, for it to be combined with neutron scattering. So you can see the buildup of uh, structure during shear in uh, dense food systems. Uh, and there's, uh, there are, of course, uh, several examples of high pressure cells for neutron scattering. And I show here one, the one we used in the, Switzerland, uh, designed by Col, uh, Joachim Kolbrecher, and we used it for uh, looking at uh, the falling apart of casein micelles at high pressure, which I will show the results of uh, later. Um, now here uh, are some uh, serious cases, uh, at least on the, on the left you see uh, what fouling actually is. Uh, this is this is an heat exchanger for UHT treatment of milk uh, after a few hours of action, and um, that is of course not good. And um, it would be really interesting to see how this fouling starts, uh, where it exactly starts in this in this uh, um, designed uh, surface, 
and um, and of course in the end uh, obtain information to uh, to control it. And on the right hand side you see in the tabletop homogenizer and what you actually would like to do is uh, look inside this head. Um, can I have an um, no I don't see my oh, I can make an uh, I oh here here's a pointer uh, so this is the the homogenizer head and uh, inside that looks more or less like this here and uh, there's a complex uh, dynamic equilibrium between uh, droplets uh, being formed droplets being bra uh, being um, uh, coalesce uh, or um, uh, melting together again and uh, on top of that you have the dynamic equilibrium of uh, surfactant moving into the surface and away from it and it's not certain at all at which stage of homogenization and, and, and at which settings you have the emulsion that you actually want yeah, you, you, it's quite arbitrary what you do. You just use a lot of pressure, but it is not clear at all that you need all that pressure. And uh, and it may very well be that, that the design is also not optimal. So you would like to see inside this uh, pressure head. Um, now in here uh, is my case for uh, um, for spray drying and for for drying in general um, for, by spraying. Um, here I uh, I have an. Uh, hmm. No, this morning it worked anyway. Um, uh, this movie is an. Um, is, oh, so um, I think you, you need to go out from the laser pointer to to the oh. normal, then you can start it. Okay. Um, yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. here you see uh, 100 milliseconds of spray drying. And. Um, what what you, what you should note is that it is so irregular, um, and th this looks like an, a nice uh, misty cone, uh, but what you actually see is the is the sound you hear. Uh, this this makes a hissing sound, and uh, there's a typical uh, ten millisecond periodicity in in in, in yeah in what comes out, and that uh, now that is to illustrate how complicated spray drying actually is, and uh, that. Has probably an, a close link with the precise shear conditions inside the nozzle, and um, one of the things that is probably the case is uh, usually spray drying um, is applied on, on, on very high solid uh, feeds, like 50, 40 percent of protein, or 50, 40, 50 percent of protein, and. Uh, and uh, that is probably highly shear thinning and uh, it may very well be that you have a lot of shear bending inside this nozzle, and that is probably not good, but certainly influencing uh, what happens uh, just outside the nozzle. And uh, for redesigning these nozzles uh, for taking into account this uh, this this shear bending, uh, you would have to look inside the nozzle and Newton scattering could do that. Um, it's of course not so easy to mount an uh, and, and uh, neutron scattering beam uh, in, an, in a real spray dryer tower. Uh, so uh, you could start with uh, electro spinning because there, the type of problems is, is the same. It is also hard to get stable and uh, you have a high shear. Of course, the situation is completely different and you get widely different products as, as is shown there at the bottom. Um, but uh, also for general scientific purposes, it would be nice to do uh, electro spinning in a neutron beam. Uh, okay, so now I will come to my uh, my uh, results of, of uh, all the work we did. I will show uh, one result from wide angle neutron scattering where we looked at the hydrogen bonding network in the sugar glass. And I will show some uh, results of small angle neutron scattering. Uh, actually, one was already shown this morning in the, during the pitch by uh, Wim Baumann, so I will not uh, go into that very deeply. And uh, the high pressure treatment of casein. So uh, it is important to know the to know something about the hydrogen bond network in the, in glassy sugars because glassy sugars are often used for encapsulating things, and uh, the quality of an encapsulate made by sugar glass is uh, set by how well it accommodates water, how well diffusion diffu uh, uh, how well water diffuses through uh, and the, the glassy matrix, and. Uh, 
Now, for that, it is uh, definitely it, it's probably not essential, but this is uh, gives confidence when you know something about the structure, the molecular structure of of, an, uh, of the sugar class. Uh, we did that for glucose uh, because it's an easy sugar to work with, and um, we uh, we we took fully uh, hydrogenated uh, glucose. We took uh, glucose that's, uh, for, of which the exchangeable H atoms were exchanged for D and uh, a 50-50 mixture of those. And um, now then you have an, a, an, a set of data, which is basically a set of unknowns or unknowns from which you can uh, calculate the unknowns being uh, the radial distribution function of H with H uh, and H with O and, uh, and X with X, where X is anything like O or C. Um, and we did that at uh, three temperatures where at 80 degrees, where it was uh, completely liquid at the glucose and just at the glass transition. And uh, also at a much lower temperature deep uh, under the glass transition. And we looked at the structure. Now, now I only show the uh, GHH, so sort of the um, radial distribution function of the H atoms, the exchangeable H atoms, so not the covalent H atoms. And uh, that gives the, the essence of the hydrogen hydrogen bond network. And uh, now what is important to note is that uh, the liquid and the glass at the glass transition is practically the same, with the red and the green. Uh, but when you uh, cool the glass, it's, it starts to, yeah, to move on, as it were, uh, in, in structural terms. And uh, you get something really quite different, uh, certainly at longer uh, distances. And um, the hydrogen bond network, is, the, the, at least the, the small scale uh, part of it is, uh, is shown there on the right. And uh, it's a bit different from water. Uh, you would ideally like to do this also with glass with a bit, little bit of water in it. Uh, but we never got to that. But that is something that uh, may be done in the future. Um, small and neutron scattering. Now here again, uh, here's one of the many pictures of, uh, of depictions of uh, a case in myself. Um, I think most people know that the stability of casein mast cells comes from the steric repulsion of the hairy uh, layer on the, at the outside uh, made by the kappa casein. And uh, destabilizing casein, uh, you, you can do by cutting off the hairs and then you make cheese, or you can uh, collapse the hairs and then you make yogurt. The latter you do with uh, acidification and the former you do with an enzyme. Um, these, these, uh, but for the rest, these, uh, these in my cells are surprisingly stable. So you can boil them, you can freeze them, you can put a lot of, uh, put, put them in a lot of uh, salt, and they all survive that. But they do not survive acidification, and they do not, at least not in a stable form. Eh? The, the my cells uh, stay intact, but, uh, um, but what they do really don't uh, survive is high pressure. Then they really fall apart. Um, first, we look at this uh, effect of uh, destabilizing uh, by cutting off the hairs or uh, collapsing the hairs. Now that this was already shown by uh, by Wim Bauman, we, we I did the work uh, on casein uh, together with him, so I won't go into this. Now there is again this picture. Now that uh, Wim Bauman already said uh, most interesting things about it. Uh, the only thing I can add is that there is this subtle difference uh, between structure formation after uh, cutting the hairs or and after uh, collapsing the hairs. So making rennet is not precisely the same as making yogurt. And it has probably something to do with, uh, with the fact that um, it's a very subtle effect which, which uh, we studied that NISO, and, and that uh, comes down on that uh, you when you shave with an enzyme, enzyme the, the case in my cells, then you locally shave it only. At least uh, more, it is not not an homogeneous shaving, and uh, so you get patches where 
calcification mast cells uh, start to stick together. And the acidification is a more global effect. And then, um, yeah, it's easy to accept probably that you get something different then. I mean, how that precisely works out, that is another question, but, uh, uh, but it was nice to, to be able to see it in this way. Um, now, finally, I will say something um, about the high pressure treatment of uh, casein mice cells. Um, uh, here we uh, took special care uh, that the solvent uh, of the casein mice cells is uh, saturated calcium phosphate, and that is important for the casein mice cells because um, casein mice cells are basically a way to uh, to accommodate calcium phosphate in the conditions where it actually doesn't dissolve. And then we believe, uh, at least people with whom I did this work, uh, we believe that the that the, the controlling parameter of the destabilization of casein mice cells at high pressure is the measure of supersaturation of the case of the case of the calcium phosphate. That changes when you apply pressure. So we uh, took as a solvent a solution of uh, uh, milk serum. So we, we, we collected milk serum by, by, by ultra centrifugation. Then we freeze dry that, and then you get a powder, and this powder you can then redissolve again in D2O, and then you have an, uh, a solvent which uh, looks a lot like uh, milk, milk serum. And um, it also gives you then the proper reference uh, that is the same system of uh, milk, milk serum uh, without the micelles. Um, so we uh, stepped up in pressure from uh, ambient to 300 bar. And then you see that the scattering goes down a lot. Um, and that is because the case of mice fall apart. And um, you also surprisingly see an iso isosbestic point. So that, that suggests that, there, that, that you, have an, you, you get a uh, population of two. Uh, groups of um, objects that scatter. Uh, and um, that happens precisely at the point where you get a shoulder. So there's in the neutron scattering, you hardly see a shoulder in the, uh, which is in contrast with X-ray scattering. Uh, and uh, precisely at the point where uh, the shoulder appears after pressure, you also have this isosplastic point. Uh, and um, on the right hand side, there's a kind of uh, approximate size distribution which, which corresponds to this scattering pattern. And uh, now yeah, you see that you go from large objects, scattering objects, to objects that are about uh, 10 times smaller uh, at high pressure. Um, now, but then you, when you then uh, release the pressure again, and uh, then uh, the pressure comes up again, but, but what you end up with is a mess. So uh, the, the, the system is not able to find back the, the nice native uh, casein micelle structure that was made by the cow. Um, now and here is what it looks like afterwards. So you clearly see that uh, the transparency has gone up a lot because of the high pressure treatment. So this is not anymore at high pressure, but it is after that high pressure. And that uh, corresponds well with the fact that you uh, have much less scattering and, and much less, much, much smaller scattering entities. Um, now the model, uh, which um, at least explains what you see, if it's true is another thing, but it explains what you see, um, is here. Um, the, the, the orange background, that is an, um, the, 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 the darkness of that is a degree of, is, the, is supposed to reflect the supersaturation of calcium phosphate. So it's supersaturated at ambient conditions. Uh, when you uh, apply the pressure, this supersaturation goes away. Uh, so there's not really an, a reason anymore for the casein to, uh, to casein mice cells to exist. And uh, they fall apart. Uh, the, 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 the nuclei of calcium phosphate, which hold together my cell, uh, dissolve. And then you are, uh, 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 everything uh, is then determined by the hydrophobicity of some of the casein 
molecules, mainly the beta casein, and they form their own little uh, uh, micelles. And that is then probably the 10 nanometer entities uh, which you see uh, at high pressure. And uh, when then you go down the pressure again, then uh, initially you have these uh, small beta casein uh, entities. Um, the supersaturation comes on again, and uh, casein or ca calcium phosphate start, starts to nucleate again and form particles. Uh, but these particles uh, yeah, are uh, poorly accommodated by the uh, casein uh, molecules. And uh, therefore, you get this uh, messy structure of larger things that uh, cause the higher scattering uh, at ambient pressure. Um, okay, so that brings me to my conclusion already. Um, so I, um, you probably agree that uh, neutron scattering is un uniquely suitable uh, to shed light on specific issues in fundamental food science. Now, one of the some of these issues are really quite urgent, especially what uh, what happens in a nozzle, in a spraying nozzle, and um, also uh, what happens in an uh, in the narrow confinement of a high treat high high heat uh, treatment uh, line so the UHD treatment uh, what happens precisely when uh, when does the fouling start and where does the fouling start can you for instance start uh, co correlate the starting points of the fouling with certain geometries or uh, defects in the stainless steel uh, now, possible further work, and I mentioned already quite a lot. Um, you could look uh, in, into further detail uh, to uh, calcium phosphate, because I, um, well, I mentioned a lot this supersaturation and the fact that it uh, comes out of solution, uh, comes, um, goes into solution when you uh, pressurize, but uh, you would like to really measure that. And uh, the neutron scattering is, is ideal for that, also wide angle neutron scattering, because you could work with uh, 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 isotopic su substitution of calcium. Um, and that is actually, that would solve uh, an important chapter of dairy science, eh? because dairy science is actually calcium phosphate science, and the rest is just uh, colloid science. Um, yeah, unfolding of proteins at high pressure, and uh, that is um, an old subject. Uh, but that is definitely certainly for for these food food uh, proteins um, and, and and the new plant proteins uh, quite uh, unexplored. I, I already already mentioned the interaction with protein of protein with steel under industrial conditions. So you would like to build an uh, an, an uh, semi-industrial heating line of a meter or two meters or so inside and. and uh, a neutron beam. Uh, now I already mentioned the structure of classic carbohydrates containing water. And another thing I did not mention, but that is also quite urgent, is uh, why some cryoprotectants uh, for keeping uh, live cells alive uh, during uh, storage under freezing conditions. Uh, why do they work? And because it is very erratic. Uh, some sugars work, some amino acids work and um, neutron scattering would be ideal certainly because it's able to to show this uh, hydrogen bonding network to uh, shed light on that okay that uh, that was it thank you very much thank you Hans, for a very nice and interesting talk uh, we have some questions here uh, from anna here saying very nice movie of the spray drying nozzle uh, what type of nozzle did you use? Do yeah, I have to be completely honest. This this was not a, a spray drying for grown ups. This, this this was a boogie, a tabletop boogie. Uh, so the spray drying is not the same as, the, as as the real spray drying with which you make infant formula. Uh, that it's actually driven by air, uh, but it's a start, and it is a bit difficult to to mount in the. And, and a high-speed camera which weighs 10 kilos or so inside the real uh, spray drying tower. So, uh, but that is um, what was a bit eye-opener for us is that you can see in this way how irregular this spraying actually is. 
Uh, there was also another question regarding uh, spray drying there. Do you think nozzle flow influenced the powder particles? Absolutely, yes. No, that is also a well-known fact. I mean, people people try to increase the solids content of the feed all the time. Eh? So uh, from, from from 40 to 50 and uh, uh, higher than 50 percent. So you get kind of uh, porridge nearly, which which you push into the in a no nozzle. And uh, it is well known that when you cross something like 55 percent or so. Uh, that that uh, the, the powder changes which you get, and um, you could look for the source in the nozzle. There can also be other things at, at play, of course. But uh, um, yeah, that uh, part of the, the the problem is probably that that you have uh, complex phenomena inside this nozzle. Yeah, uh, there are more questions here um, from Maud Langton. Uh, in milk, you have also whey proteins, and during heating, the whey protein attain to the micelle surface. How can you detect that? Uh, I think, yeah, the, the, my first guess would be that you do light scattering and, and look at the size of the micelles uh, after dilution. I don't think you need neutron scattering for that. And you can look at the, the centrifugability of the micelles and then see if you uh, get rid of whey protein in the supernatant. But that can also be because the the, the whey protein aggregates with itself. Um, so um, yeah, I would really look at the size. What I am asking is that that's one of the reasons why you can make yogurt. That you can make, sorry, what? Yogurt. Yeah. That the oh, yeah, well, yes, it, it certainly affects the properties the, of the yogurt, yes. From the carpet around the micelles. Yes. And that's restrict the uh, um, collapse of the, if you don't have the boiling uh, before yogurt making, the yogurt will cluster in large lump. Yes. Yes, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, I also have a question, Hans. I, I think about this homogenization you would like to study. I mean, uh, what kind of time resolution do you foresee that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no. You get an average, of course. No, no, no. The, 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 the art will be to, uh, to distill from the average uh, structure which you measure uh, to distill from that uh, the, the the shape, the size, the distribution, the absorption uh, of of, uh, of the droplets and the, and the proteins, yes. So, um, but at least that's something. Eh? Now, now you know nothing. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a very nice idea. Uh, I, I also thought of another thing about this uh, age, uh, and the hydrogen and deuterium substitution. Because uh, as you said, it's, it's only some of the hydrogen that you can uh, substitute. But, yes. but, but I mean, for instance, if, if you have, instead of water, you have D2O, can you have an interaction between the hydrogen and the, the deuterium of the water, for instance, so to say that you have extra? Yeah, no, yeah, yes. Um, now you have to do that carefully, of course. But in this experiment, the criterion for the for for the for the acceptance of D two O was that the glass transition hardly changed. Um, when when we went to, to the full D two O uh, situation, um, so um, yeah, you you will have to work with this this series of substitutions in order to to make sure that. Uh, uh, that the water really behaves like uh, like like water or like like one thing that you're not looking at uh, yeah that you're not looking at uh, fractionation between H2O and D2O uh, in, in in certain positions yep. in the network yeah that would be interesting on its own by the way but it is not uh, not not re reflecting uh, the the real world uh, the practical world of course yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there is any more question. Please uh, feel free to uh, either write in the chat or orally take it up.
Okay, it seems like there are no more questions. So with that, thank you very much, Hans, for a very nice talk. Uh,